thanks Damien for 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 taking time I know uh it's it's crazy times that we're in and uh, the little moments that we get to have a conversation i think they've uh, come in to really help uh, with people understanding because most of us are now spending our time online just checking what's happening in our spaces of work uh our social uh, places and everything else uh, but i think before we start uh, it'll be great for my audience and um uh others that are watching us now uh, to understand uh, who Damien is and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it well uh, Damien Petty uh, is and uh, what you represent. Yeah so I'm the president of IATSE Local 212 here in Calgary so I represent stagehands and motion picture technicians. Mm -hmm. We have 1,050 members currently and um, I'm also an international vi vice president of IATSE, which is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Mm -hmm. We are the largest entertainment union in the world. We have about 150,000 members uh, currently in North America. So um, we represent a diverse group of motion picture technicians and stagehands. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's... That's a huge number of creators uh, represented um, and under the unions uh, uh, and also the organizations that you represent. And it's interesting to know that you're also uh, the vice president of the international uh, organization, which will help in, in, in us understanding more uh, on the stand position um, uh, with regard guidelines and uh, the perspective uh, around COVID-19 um, uh, right now, uh, probably to just uh, track back, uh, we we were all found shut down. Uh, I think mid February, uh, yeah, in Alberta, and um, all productions had to go on hold, and the trend just then went uh, throughout the world, and everyone had to just you know stay put, kind of, and away from productions, and that's a huge blow for some people. Uh, especially people like me who are uh, used to being on sets and uh, making films and, uh, and, and stuff like that, that became a huge blow. Um, from uh, your uh, position, um, what were you faced with? Were you ever prepared for something like this to, to go for a prolonged period without being on, on, on productions? And, and how did it affect you? In yeah, so... It was absolutely catastrophic. And, you know, the shutdown that occurred ar around March 13th, which, which was a Friday the 13th, mm, yeah. was global. And um, we saw all of our stages and all of our studios shut down simultaneously. Mm. There yeah. may have been one or two small projects that we're still trying to shoot, but uh, I would say 99% of everything shut down. Um, it's been a challenge. Uh, luckily, in Canada, the government has given some federal reliefs, um, although in the, in the case of stagehands and the theater venues, uh, the shutdown will continue possibly for at least another year. So wow. um, that's devastating. What has happened on the motion picture side of things is that uh, in the last five months, there's been the largest negotiation that I've ever been part of. Mm -hmm. And uh, it involves all of the unions and guilds, primarily United States based, mm -hmm. but also um, in Canada, certainly IATSE is involved mm -hmm. um, with the studios. So the big six studios, as well as some of the big streamers, uh, which are Netflix and Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine, all of these groups have been in a negotiation to uh, come up with the standardized COVID production protocols for yeah. our industry. Now, these are for larger productions, typically with more than 50 people involved. But these negotiations, and I'm optimistic that they will conclude soon, mm -hmm. um, have been very, very complex. And the primary driver behind it uh, is SAG-AFTRA that represent actors in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. These, these uh, projects that have these actors on have really high world-class testing standards. Right. So when you have SAG-AFTRA um, involved, 
they require testing up to three times a week and more for people working in the riskiest uh, part of a film set, which is, it's called, Netflix calls it the red zone. Mm -hmm. um, some producers call it zone A. But what mm -hmm. we're talking about there is the zone where actors are wearing no PPE yeah, right. and the risk is at the highest and people like the boom op and others are really, um, they're in that zone and they're in close proximity. Mm -hmm. So this has been going on for months and I'm hopeful uh, that, and that uh, those negotiations will conclude in the very near future. I can't really discuss them in detail because they're mm -hmm. ongoing. Yeah. But what that is, is a template for the best standards established by epidemiologists and uh, um, industrial health experts um, who've been consulted on every scenario on a film set and, right. and they've weighed in. So um, now's kind of an interesting time for you and I, Nick, to be yeah. having this discussion because we're absolutely at that point where all the productions that ceased have returned mm -hmm. and that new productions have ramped up uh, with new guidelines. So this is exactly the point at which all of that stuff is happening. Yeah. Locally, we have three projects currently shooting. Uh, two of them uh, were stopped uh, on March 13th mm -hmm. and have since resumed. So that's Black Summer for Netflix mm -hmm. and uh, also locally produced uh, Winona Earp. Yes. So on top of that, you've got Heartland season 14 that went to camera. We have a Hallmark project. Mm -hmm. So Hallmark would have SAG involvement. So you can mm -hmm. imagine the COVID standards would be yeah. high. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. thing that's interesting that now um, I can have an opinion about is uh, there is a, there is a large dichotomy between uh, Canadian production and I'll say studio and streamer based production mm -hmm. that the standards are very different. And um, again, it comes down to things like, how often people are tested mm -hmm. in zone A, in the red zone. And there's other issues. And, um, you know, here in Alberta, we had our chief medical officer, Dina Hinshaw, say yesterday mm -hmm. that um, uh, we have to do everything we can to keep people who are sick out of the workplace. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the typical uh, projects uh, from the studios and streamers they look at up to 10 days sick pay, the mm -hmm. COVID leave for people who are quarantined to look after other people mm -hmm. uh, who have COVID or if they have it themselves. And the idea is that um, uh, you could pass the screening, you could keep your temperature down. If you were uh, had to put food on the table, you might take, um, you might take some ibuprofen or something to keep your mm -hmm. temperature down and still go to set because you've yeah. got a family to feed. Yeah. So um, the, the thinking around that is let's hope nobody needs it. But if somebody, if somebody's quarantined or actually has COVID, you absolutely have to look after them. So the systems we have are about keeping people in different groups. Mm. They're in different work pods. And in the United States and in Canada, there have been a couple of positive tests. And we've seen that productions are able to isolate the groups mm -hmm. and shut down uh, a pod or an individual in a way that they may not have to stop the entire production for an extended period of time. Right. But again, this is risky. And uh, it's about how we manage those risks. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things, looking at the unions and the guilds and probably the government itself uh, in trying to mitigate the spread, flatten the cave, whatever they're trying to do, um, how well are they controlling the propping up of uh, the small productions? Because there's a lot of guys now, you know, they have short films, uh, zero budget films or small little budget films that they they've wanted to have done but had to stop but now they've gone back uh but most of them are not union based you know they're they're not covered by any union uh, it's just people coming together film uh, uh cast and a crew uh, agreeing they're gonna go on set and and still trying to have all the pp in, in place 
but if someone does get sick or, or get a positive uh, uh, indicator on set, uh, I mean, does it then reflect to how the government has okayed uh, people going back into productions um, and, and stuff like that? Yeah, so absolutely, we're aware that uh, there are very small projects that are going ahead and there are commercials. Some mm -hmm. commercials have different standards, um, but you're right. There are people who are um, not, do not have the luxury of uh, robust funding and they also have a smaller crew. So the two factors, a smaller crew and a shorter mm -hmm. uh, shooting period mitigates that risk. But it's absolutely incumbent for people, and there are courses about uh, basic set safety that people have been taking. You know, if they're if they're using the PPE and they're distancing and they're in well ventilated areas, I see these small projects are very much into location shoots where the risk yeah. is much lower when you're yeah. outdoors. Initially, we thought the reverse would be true when this mm -hmm. pandemic started. It was more about surfaces you touch right. and areas you could control. Mm -hmm. So if you'll remember, the thinking was the studios could control, but the locations couldn't. In fact, the reverse is, uh, I won't say the reverse, but mm -hmm. outdoor locations are favorable and many producers are writing scripts that uh, allow the action to be outdoors mm -hmm. more. Um, what we're hearing from the scientists is it's all about quality airflow, we talk about types of HEPA filters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the larger projects where you have the circus, the people working in the trailers, uh, they minimize how many people can be in the trailer, who can be in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And then um, you have a, a concerted effort to keep the number of background performers to the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And so all of these efforts combined uh, really, really help to mitigate the risk. I will say with the union involvement and with the, um, the standards that have been negotiated, there are higher standards and lower standards. And what I'm seeing with my members, even with the shows we've signed, people are starting to get choosy. Yeah. You have a show that has uh, three times a week testing for yeah. everyone in zone A and is going to pay you two weeks pay if you get sick versus yeah. a show that doesn't have that. Yeah. Um, we've had several of our members turn certain projects down and uh, go in favor of the much, much safer uh, show that follows all of the protocols. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. It's completely a different world on set. The jobs are different. And even the personnel on set, you have all these cleaners on set, you've got COVID supervisors and different departments are affected differently, mm -hmm. but I'll give the example of uh, a craft service. It's yeah. a completely different world. There's no yeah. buffet table. If right. you had a crew of two, it might be a crew of four now. It's all uh -huh. about how do people access that food and they're handed it individually and it's wrapped. And so mm -hmm. even how people eat their meal, they're isolated, they eat in groups. They, uh, you can all be, on the same lineup at the same time for the food, you're served mm -hmm. individually, someone supervising that workflow. Uh, it's, uh, it's completely different jobs and a different um, experience on the set. And I'd say it's much harder. Yeah, yeah. And, and another thing though, uh, just looking at how we uh, re-entering, um, again, I'm going to reference the small budget uh, film, yeah, sure. films as well. Um, is it mandatory that people take up the training um, uh, on, on how they can handle themselves on set, how they, they prepare the sets for, for safety and, and maintaining the guidelines that have been given? Is it mandatory? Uh, where can people take these courses if there are any? Um, and also probably the, the, the other ask will be, because I've done the, the, the um, uh, etiquette uh, training with, with your local uh, union there um it's it's pretty much basic and to the core and also teaches you certain things that you then embrace when you actually then go on a, on a professional set and you're like oh yeah um these are the things that i learned there is it the same setup are you uh, as a union taking up the, the courses to train people on safety uh protocols as well 
Yeah, so there's a couple pieces to your question, and mm -hmm. and uh, it uh, I'll speak to all all ranges of production from the very smallest right. to the largest. So the I'll start with the largest. Um, large projects like for Netflix, for example, mm -hmm. they have a requirement of training mm -hmm. um, that not only includes specific stuff that's approved by the unions and the and the studios. Mm -hmm. But there's a, like a course, Safe Sets International is one of them that people are taking. It's free. So that's actually required by them. And other shows that, that we service have the same uh, types of requirements. There's a 90-minute training video that you must take before. And you must also be tested prior to your pre-employment, tested mm -hmm. for co COVID, so diagnostic testing. As we get further down though, it gets um, to the lower and lower budgets. It's up to each production to set that standard as to whether or not, um, you know, I would recommend that they all have some, at least the safe sets mm -hmm. training that's free for people to take. And uh, it gives people an understanding of what the hazards and risks are and just a, a basic protocol level. But it's very different from production to production and what I've seen, because I'm involved in the negotiations for the large studios, as well as the one-offs with uh, Canadian producers, mm -hmm. there is quite a range between a Canadian production and, and a studio and a streamer. Right. And uh, it, it boils down to economic uh, positions on how, how frequent testing should be or how many sick days you might get if you're, if you're symptomatic. So... Mm -hmm. um, and and so we see a we see a spectrum. The dream was to have one set of standards because right. in the real world it may work on paper, but in the real world, my members are I I might have one member on one set that their partner is on a different set. Right. The assumption of production is that they control all aspects. Well, you only control the work hours. You don't right. control who someone's partner is or if mm -hmm. they have children in a school that's infected. You know, we look at the uh, active cases in Canada yeah. and, you know, the stats. I was looking at it today. Alberta has the highest number of active cases per mm -hmm. 100,000 in the country. So we're at about 38.5 cases per 100,000 and Ontario is at 10. Mm -hmm. But I think what my point here is the risk factors change. So where it might be appropriate to only test once or only test every two weeks for people in the red zone, if you have a, an extraordinarily high infection rate, let's say 3% mm -hmm. of the COVID tests are positive or higher, mm -hmm. that might change your threshold where you might need to test more frequently. And the real risk in Canada is insurance. There's still an, right. uh, we've lobbied the federal government to try and backstop some of these uh, Canadian productions. People have come up with extraordinarily creative uh, mm -hmm. solutions, but um, we want to make sure that everyone's protected because if there's a, if the government declares a shutdown or nobody can have more than 15 people in a workplace, mm -hmm. we really need to make sure that uh, people are looked after because, um, Mm -hmm. When the first shutdown occurred, everyone did have insurance. Mm -hmm. So that meant that everyone at least got a week's severance under the contracts I work yeah. with. And that went as high as some companies paid five weeks severance. Mm -hmm. So that really sort of looked after people. Um, mm -hmm. We want to make sure that there's some kind of insurance, some kind of backstop. But I think the biggest risk is that it all shuts down again. I can't predict the future, but I look at the yeah. curves on the graphs and I yeah. go, all these kids back in school and then yes. uh, the risk of spread is definitely there. So uh, while I'm optimistic, we've got a lot of new projects coming into Alberta mm -hmm. and I'm excited and I see a lot of independent low budget activity going on as well. Um, everybody knows there's a the shadow of the next uh, wave uh, could, ha could hit soon. Some, yeah. pe some of my yeah. colleagues are predicting early October. I don't want, really want to stick my neck out, but I think yeah. the risk is there. Yeah. And I think I see you kind of agreeing with that, that this could go, uh, this could get very bad if we're not careful.
No, I think given the the stats that already come in in a week of kids returning to school, it 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 just points out to what is to come if nothing uh, is done to try and uh, you know look look into those issues, the factors that are um, are causing the just the spread. Um, I was talking to my kids last night after watching the news, and I was like, "So, what are you guys doing at school to make sure you you know?" Uh, you you stay safe, um, and their responses just gave me an indication of exactly what uh, we're going to expect is going to happen. These are kids; uh, you can't expect them to, you know, uh, uh, behave like adults where they will sanitize and not hug each other, sure, um, yeah, uh, or just play around, you know, with each other or touch surfaces that might have an infection on and then stuff like that. So we can't. Uh, predict certain things, but we we can be you know clever enough to understand that this thing has been with us for a couple of months. We've been checking the trends, and 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 was it the right time to to send the kids back to school, uh, or we're going to do well with them online? So there's a lot of uh, factors. I think it comes down to to the same. Filmmakers went back into on, into sets, and they there have been cases already um, uh, coming off sets um, of people, you know, uh, getting the the infections and stuff like that. But but I think the my next question will be just looking at um, the negotiations, the talks that have been going on. Um, when do you think an agreement will probably come? Uh, between the studio, uh, studios, unions, and, and the guilds uh, to sort of have a, a roadmap uh, and say, guys, we're going to go on a hold, uh, but this is the agreement. Uh, yeah. I think, I think we're extraordinarily close. Obviously, a number of productions have started up prior to the final agreement between the various parties. I will say that a, some of it is already agreed to and already in practice. Mm -hmm. There is a document that was uh, put out by SAG-AFTRA called the Safe Way Forward. And a lot of the concepts about working in groups and uh, uh, frequency of testing, mm -hmm. those, those principles are being used already. Right. So I think it comes down to the finer points. I would hope that the nego I can't predict it, but I would hope the negotiations are done within the next two weeks. We're awfully close. This has been a monolithic negotiation. You wouldn't believe how many parties are involved and how many sidebars. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's the biggest negotiation probably I will ever be a party to in my whole life. Yeah. And so um, it's gone a long way in, in four to five months and it's right. down to the last few words about protocols and things. Uh, the other thing that the parties agree is that it keeps changing. And, and even the advice I was mentioning earlier, the advice about ventilation, it's more mm -hmm. about airflow mm -hmm. really than uh, it was. And that gets into conversations about atmospheric smoke mm -hmm. on set. It's not believed that the smoke carries the virus, yeah. but it is believed that in some cases uh, it can compromise your vascular systems right. and uh, make you more prone should, should an outbreak occur. So some projects are mitigating their use of smoke mm -hmm. and some are using it, but surveying the crew to see if anybody has asthma and pre-existing mm -hmm. conditions that may be triggered. Mm -hmm. So um, even me discussing this shows how complicated it is, how many yeah. different layers and levels so I will say to your question that I'm optimistic that, that the um, final document will be within the next two weeks. Okay. That's me being optimistic. And then from there, many of the layers that we're discussing, the Safe Way Forward document is already out there and being used and agreed mm -hmm. to by the parties. And we see here in Alberta, we're dealing with Netflix. A lot of what they, mm -hmm. are, they have rolled out are are what the epidemiologists have asked for. Mm -hmm. It's very, very safe. I mean, they issue people with face shields and N95 right. masks with filters and all kinds of stuff and do yeah. regular testing. Uh, so those protocols are, I would say we've all had a crash course on, on 
how this all goes mm -hmm. and soon we'll be able to educate everybody to what that standard is mm -hmm. but i do see a i do see a rift between canadian production and the studios and streamers and maybe there's another category i'm learning about which is the u.s independent and the some there's kind of a middle ground with independent studios mm -hmm. and then uh, low budget Canadian independent. I think by and large, they've done a lot to mitigate the risk. Mm -hmm. And I will say the risks are less because mm -hmm. there are less people and there, uh, there is a shorter shooting schedule. I've seen right. projects that shot over like three or four days. Wow. If you can actually do that, uh, the risk of a massive spread event because it takes a four day cycle yeah. um, to, to have a major spread event. Yeah. So um, your risk goes down as you get closer to wrap and no one's tested positive. Yeah, as we, as we are wrapping up, I think, let's look at some of the positives that have also just come out of this. Um, I think this lockdown uh, or being locked out of productions and then having to come out with creative ways, we have seen it in most of the productions uh, that were actually continuing doing stuff uh, during the lockdown. Um, I could mention America's Got Talent, um, uh, uh, Trevor, Trevor Noah on, you know, uh, on his show as well. Uh, I mean, they've been producing from home uh, and America's Got Talent, if you look at the production now, uh, how amazing is it to connect with the whole world, um, uh, no audience from all over the world in one place. And then the, the, the sets themselves, um, when they, they were crafted and presentable using, you know, uh, the, the studios there because they're empty. But so they're literally just going all out of town. Uh, to just create a nice show out of this. Uh, would you say this has brought in the other creative side that we've just been sitting on and not really wanting to utilize and, and go the conventional way that we're used to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of positives, even with, um, you know, we speak to producers uh, who are interested in producing here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the use of the Zoom call, like what we're doing right now, yeah. I talk to producers in England and uh, m with much more frequency and better meetings on short notice. Right. Um, and you apply that to some of the productions you mentioned. There's pretty, Trevor Noah's show is pretty entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, what's lacking is there, uh, you know, there need to be more jobs. He's a generous yeah. person and has actually paid some of the crew that aren't working. Exactly. So we all yeah. hope for a return, but you're quite right that some of the things we do will never go back. You know, on a film set, all these uh, bundles of paper for the start pack, a lot of that, they were still paying petty cash in cash mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. cases, and people still had to collect a check from a production office. Right. I don't know how our industry evolved to be that far behind, <laughs> uh, but it did. But I think all those things will go away and that, that, it, that is a good thing because we will get better at uh, uh, pe handling people's privacy, for example, mm -hmm. you know, having all these documents floating around to prove mm -hmm. you're an Albertan so that the tax credit can apply. Exactly. So um, I think you're quite right. My only concern about all these new ways of doing things is that we do lose some of the traditional jobs and I am optimistic that the traditional jobs will come back in the same way when um, CGI and other things came out and HD, we thought we'd lose a lot of jobs in the mm -hmm. set deck and props and construction. Mm -hmm. That didn't actually happen. And there's still the physical, there's the physical elements of production that are very, very labor intensive. So I think, um, I think it'll be very different, but I think a lot of those jobs will, I hope, ultimately come back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's funny that you mentioned CGI. I have a funny reference of Game of Thrones when uh, a Starbucks cup was uh, was seen on one of the- That's shots. right. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's things like that that you, you then get to rethink and say, okay, um, should we stick to, uh, the old or the new uh, or just utilize both. Um, and I think 
after this, we'll definitely be appreciative of a lot of things and the crews that we are missing now on our sets and, uh, and, and all that, yeah. And um, whoever thought that at the craft service table, uh, the tongs that people use to grab the food, that was actually the enemy. Everyone thought the tongs were what preventing people from putting their hands in there. <laughs> it was the tongs themselves. So that'll never come back and many know. things. Uh, yeah. There are all these new jobs though, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and uh, some of them I think will probably stay in some degree, the cleaning or the safety supervisors. Right, right. Um, so let's see how it goes. I, I am a glass is half full person. I'm optimistic. Right. I'm, I feel we're very fortunate that production is resuming. Mm -hmm. And I applaud the efforts of everybody at every level. Mm -hmm. By and large, even at the lowest budget, three-day shoot, mm -hmm. I am seeing people distancing and wearing their stuff. They don't have the resources to do all the testing that the higher budget shows do. Right. But there is a really high awareness and a commitment. And some of my members weren't ready to return, and that's fine. That's yeah. their choice. Or they yeah. can pick and choose what level yeah. of risk. Yeah. So um, we're going to see this for a while. I hope the big spread doesn't happen because I am an optimist, but I think we're ready for whatever comes. Yeah. Um, I know some of the trainings that you normally do uh, are done physically and people have to be there. Um, what have you done as a, as a union, uh, as a local, um, to continue with the trainings? Uh, are you still doing them or are you still on hold? Yeah, so uh, locally we're still working on, we're revamping several things. One of them is the set etiquette. Mm -hmm. So we're putting a bit of COVID-19 protocol into the set etiquette right. and largely providing the resources to get more info specific to on set. And then with some of our, some of our regular trainings, we're looking at using uh, the Zoom platform as the way to teach them. Mm -hmm. Some of them we haven't solved yet. Yeah. We had a first aid requirement, which has a physical component. Right. Uh, so with the first aid, we're looking at uh, workaround for that right now, because uh, we still don't want people gathering, uh, even if we can distance, because it will be indoors mm -hmm. and there will be a risk to that. So we're modifying. We also have a thing with IATSE. We have the training trust, mm -hmm. which is a national thing, and they have rolled out just a ton of new training that's all online. So there's 14 new courses. Many of our members got quite bored during mm -hmm. the lockdown and have taken all 14. So you see people on social right. media with right. all their certificates on the table. I've right. taken all yeah. of this. Yeah. So there's a lot more. And that's another plus is uh, the delivery of training got cheaper and easier. Mm -hmm. You can deliver a larger degree of training to a larger group of people, which gives them access then to our industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the long run, I'm confident that this industry will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And in this area, we uh, w want to attract a large and diverse group of people who are very employable. So um, we'll ultimately get better at deliver delivering the training that people will need. So mm -hmm. that is a plus. And if we could end on a high note, uh, that's one of them. Absolutely. And uh, Calgary... Uh uh, International Film Festival is back and they, there's going to be uh, in cinema uh, viewing of movies, uh, people going back into cinema and also accessing the films online. Uh, so the two options are being thrown out there. Um, is this a positive for you? Yeah, I, you know, ultimately I think so. I mean, it's my, uh, the Calgary Film Festival is near and dear to my heart because they've always been promoters of the local industry itself, not, mm -hmm. not simply just of films, but of an industry. Mm -hmm. And so they have been very good at having uh, things that people locally can access to raise, raise the awareness of our industry. Right. So I think it's good. And, you know, I think about Disney streaming service, uh, making the decision to have Mulan online. Yeah. Granted, they charge thirty dollars or something. Yeah, but, I argued um, with my kids though, because they sure. they 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 say they say, uh, oh yeah, it's expensive. But I, I then gave them a scenario: if 
the five of us were to go uh, and they want popcorn drinks and just paying the, 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 the gate fee, uh, I mean, we're talking probably close to 50 or 60 bucks. Um, then that's and, right. Yeah. So you, you then look at both and then say, oh, okay, it probably makes sense to just pay and watch it at home. I think my family did the same math that you did and reached the same <laughs> conclusion. But I, I, you know, I look at the Disney streaming service and uh, last I checked, they had something like 60 million monthly subscribers and Netflix, I think, is around 200 million. Yeah. But Netflix took many years to get to there. Disney right. did that in, in one year. Right. Uh, uh, and a bit. And not even one year, actually. So uh, um, this is the way of the future. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fact that the film festival is uh, mixing it up a little and making some options. We see the drive-in theaters. Mm -hmm. We see all these options. We have no choice but to explore all of this, Absolutely. but um, there'll always be a demand, I hope, to go and see a movie, yeah. just like a live theater. Yeah. Uh, some of the theater companies are closing uh, their seasons next year, but we're all uh, hopeful that they return, that there will always be a demand to see a ballerina on a stage or a performer in a yeah. play or a musical yeah. um, and, uh, Lord Andrew Lloyd Webber has recently uh, made a lot of comments uh, about the future of, of live performing arts. And one of the things he's pushing for is daily testing of the performers. Right. That still doesn't quite solve your problem with the audience, yeah. but they are, they are distancing. The revenue model just doesn't work if you have less than uh, you know, if you have 50% or more of your seats are empty, the revenue is not there. Yeah. So there, we're, I'm hopeful we get this fixed. Our Jubilee Auditorium is one of the lot best live performance venues mm -hmm. uh, around, and it should be filled with people at some point when it's safe. So we've all got our hopes high on uh, there being a vaccine and it being delivered uh, yeah. in a timely way. Absolutely. But um I still think we're a long way away from it. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I missed the last experience I had was the uh, Ghostbusters uh, live musicals, uh, the, the, sound, the sound scoring on, on stage live. I mean, what an experience uh, that is. And also just seeing the involvement of the musicians in a film. Um, and that's, that's kind of a payback to them and honoring their effort. But now we, we can't do it and you know, be as up close to them. Um, the next thing would be them seeing them online doing it. Uh, it it takes off the real human touch experience that we're used to, um, and we can only wish and hope this will come back. But in, in, uh, thank you very much. I think this has been a, a good chat in just catching up on what's happening, um, and uh, hoping for the future that it it gets back to what we're used to. If not, then try and uh, fix ourselves into the normal, which is now, uh, and have the human touch again, uh, but more with the, with the cautious eye to, to it uh, always. Uh, I don't think COVID is, uh, is yet to, is to go away anytime soon. It's gonna be with us for a bit, um, and we just have to be very, very careful. Uh, any any last throwers you want to put out there before we, we end this? Well, I just want, really want to thank you for this is an important discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, motion picture industry and the performing arts are a huge, important, vital part of our economy. Mm -hmm. So you're raising awareness around that and also bringing hope mm -hmm. because we're talking about ways that it is going to come back and how it's gonna be different and how it's gonna be better. So I just wanna thank you for this initiative and the opportunity to talk to you today. And I hope we can follow up on other initiatives in the, in the future and build on any progress. Absolutely. Uh, well, I just wanna do a throw in, make sure on the 27th of September, you, you, uh, you come and experience uh, Jasmine Road film. We, we did the film with uh, uh, the producer Warren uh, um, last year, and uh, I'm glad it's having its world premiere 
in a in a cinema. Uh, fortunately, this this year uh, at at CIF. Uh, so that will be one of the highlights to to come and watch it. At CIF. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, CIF is available online. Uh, when they'll be showcasing a lot of their films online. So it's a it's a bittersweet moment uh, period. Um, have, uh, being very involved with CIF uh, as well last year. I know this time I'll be very busy with it, but it's it's not the same, and and it, it's painful to to not that. And uh, I was talking to one of the volunteers as well at CIF. They're saying, you know, this year I haven't been called in, so I don't know what's going on. I was like, well, COVID happened, so unfortunately we we can't all be there because there won't be a lot of international traffic coming in anyway. Uh, and it's it's sad to to see. Uh, that happened. Um, but at least the guys have put on an, a lot of effort. And I hope it, it's going to be the same with uh, a number of the festivals. I know Edmonton is also coming in uh, very soon. So um, we hope and pray things do change very soon. Yeah, but uh, thank you for your efforts, uh, Damien. I know you've been lobbying, fighting a lot of people. I, I follow you a lot on social media. <laughs> I, I try not to fight the, everybody. All the blows that you, you <laughs> get and uh, you try and uh, do a diplomatic fight back, which is good. And, and throwing in the facts, I think it's also what is key. Uh, people kind of run away from the facts and uh, the realities that are there um, and, and wanting to throw in theories that are not founded. So it's, it's always a good a conversation to follow. We're looking for science-based solutions here, I think. <laughs> Conspiracy theories are entertaining, but yeah, they, yeah. they, they they're good for films, right? Um, yeah, they're good for films. But yep, yeah, thank you again, and uh, we'll we'll be catching up soon. Absolutely, all the best to you, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.